Good day, everyone, and welcome to our event, the Landfrica Data On Conference. The theme of today's event is building our economic futures in the digital age. In the next two hours, we're going to go on a journey which will change or maybe transform the way that you view data and the way you understand data. Why are we having this event at this time? The reason is because the African continent is on the cusp of AI transformations in our everyday lives. By now, you may have already begun to interact with AI-driven technologies. AI stands for artificial intelligence, and it refers to technologies that have been developed to assist us in our lives. And these technologies have been developed using data. So these technologies rely on data to learn how to perform the tasks that we want them to. AI is fast and greatly affecting our lives. It's affecting the way we interact with technologies and many of you already by now are, have interacted or are interacting with AI data-driven technologies. So for example, you could be a farmer or your parent or your grandparents are like farmers who are using AI in some way to do crop disease detection and to, in order to detect diseases on crops and treat them when it's still early. You could also be using AI if you're in the health sector or in the trans transportation sector or in the agriculture sector. If you have mobile devices uh, and you, you make use of the voice assistants like the series and the uh, Google Homes, you probably try to say, hey, Siri or hey, Google, set an alarm for me or do something for me. And an interesting side quest is, have you tried interacting with these voice assistants in your native language? It will be nice to interact with them and see how they respond if they understand it. But that's a side quest. The point is, AI is, is, is in our lives and it's affecting our lives. It's transforming the way we do things with our lives. Now, most of us are consumers of AI which means that we use AI. So we use these technologies. But most of these technologies, we don't really have much influence on how they are built. So who builds these technologies that shape our lives? And you know, what decisions are made on these technologies? Who makes these decisions? And how do these decisions affect our lives? What we realize is that too often, the decisions about these technologies are made without or with very little input and recognition from the people who interact with these technologies. So in the case of language technologies, so like the voice assistants and the, and the translations and the, the voice technology and the transcription, all these technologies, most decisions about the languages or the languages there are not made by the people who speak the language or people who live with these languages or people whose lives are impacted by these languages. And so we are most times, most often consumers of these technologies. Now that it's not a bad thing. That is okay. Um, you know, there are consumers and then there are builders. But at Landfrica and I personally and many other people in this meeting I believe, we believe that everyone, whether you are a language user, so you just speak the language, 
Maybe you study the language, so you're like a language expert. Whether you are a doctor, whether you're a farmer, whether you are a student, whether you are a businessman, we believe that everyone has the ability to be a builder of these AI data-driven technologies that we use. So when you move from consumer to builder, you begin to shape these technologies that are built to ensure that they better represent the interest of, of maybe the interest of your language, if you are from the language side, or the interest of your hospital, if you're from a doctor side, or the interest of your farming community, if you're from the agricultural side. But the point is, when you become a builder, or when you start looking at data-driven technologies from a builder perspective, you're sort of empowered, because suddenly you, you're empowered to make decisions on how these technologies affect you you're not just using it but you are empowered to transform these technologies in your own little way i'm not talking of like a worldwide transformation that makes such a like a huge impact no it doesn't have to be such a a blast it could be a tiny thing but you make you you make you know, you, you, you give a say on how a technology affects you and the people you care about or the community. So this, this, this thing of moving from a consumer to builder is integral to the core of this event. If there's anything to one major thing to take away from this event is how do you move from consuming data-driven technologies to building them? When you build them, I don't really mean like building them literally, I mean in the sense of being empowered, it could be empowered with the skills and knowledge, but being empowered to transform these technologies, transform your lives uh, with these technologies. So this is the core of what we are doing at Landfreaker. One of the ethos that motivates the score is one thing we call data farming at Landfreaker. And data farming is the opposite of data mining. So again, these technologies are data driven, which means that they rely on lots of data, right? So what typically happens is that when these technologies are built, the pipeline is as follows. It usually starts with, oh, we have a data set. We got it from somewhere. And then we start pre-processing the data and building models and then uh, deploying the technologies, okay? But it starts with the assumption of a data set that exists. The concept of data farming is that rather than starting here with just a data set, like we already have the data, we should involve the data providing channels because it's people who created this data. It's, it's, it's their efforts towards this data. So we should involve the, the data providing channels and we should when you involve them in the pipeline, it changes the way we view data. And by we, I mean those who are building the technologies, but also those who are using the technologies. It changes the way you view the data. And the core essence of data farming is how do we build a symbiotic relationship between the builders, the, the technologists, and the data providing com communities. Because we believe that a symbiotic relationship is the way forward. So that's the thing that actually leads to growth of people when both sides are benefiting. So how do we give impactful benefit back to the data providers as the data providers are providing the data? And when I say impactful benefit, I'm not talking about money. Because a lot of people say, oh, it's just money. You want money. That is not true. 
impactful benefit is not about money. It's about it's about recognizing that the data providers are, are an important component of the AI development pipeline and taking their interests into consideration. So impactful benefit could very well be about empowerment. It could be about providing job opportunities, which many um, AI companies are doing. It could be about education, mentorship, skills, training. It could also be involving them in the technological development. So there are many ways this can, this can happen. The core point here is recognizing that the data providers are an important part. Recognizing that the data providers are an important part of the AI development pipeline. But that changes the whole narrative once we recognize that they are part of the pipeline. And now I move slowly into the, the topic of today. Today's event is the beginning of a series of trying to look at how we can become not just consumers of AI and data-driven technologies, but also builders of them. There are lots of data-driven technologies out there. This uh, funnel thing is just to a few of them. There are lots of them out there. There, there will be lots of them in the future because the fact is the world is going more and more digital and data-driven. Some would say AI is the future, but I'm not making such a statement here. But the point is there's going to be lots and lots of data-driven technologies, which means there's going to be lots and lots of data, lots of data that are required, lots of data that are used. Of course, we all know that right now for many of these um, products, you are, we are basically giving away our data for free. But what we're trying to do in this first meeting that we're going to have is the concept of what we call data business. Now, data business is, is, is less about the business thing, I, the way you conventionally think of business, but it's more about a mindset because conventionally we don't think much about data because you know it's just a bunch of numbers and things there we also don't think much about the applications of data so we don't think much about things that can be built right? the builder mindset like how could i use this data to solve a problem how could I use this data to transform something I care about? And the idea of the, the core idea of this data business thing is really to, to change your mentality about data by showing you how it could be possible to use data to create empowerment the empowerment could be skills it could be economic it could be anything but the idea here is how do we create empowerment through data and at this point we will have our co-facilitator mr samuel who will take on this part of the discussion just a little brief, why on conference? Uh, the, so on, on conference is a, it's kind of like a conference in the sense that people come together, like you have gathered here to uh, attend an event. So you're probably gonna watch a presentation. But the, the difference here is that we, we more attention is paid to the voices of the participants. 
not the voices of the speaker, but the participants. So we want to create this event in a way that will encourage you to interact with what we are doing. And specifically, as Samuel is presenting, he's doing his presentation, you're going to be having segments called pause and reflect. So you're going to have this kind of slides on your on the screen and these slides give us a moment to sit down and meditate on what we've just heard and think about it in the context of our lives and bring it down to our lives and our environment and our you know bring it down to us so and then we would also ask you questions and you can reply and interact and we'll be using the zoom chat for that okay i guess on the first pause and reflect it will probably make sense we'll be having five minutes for each pause and reflect sessions again to reiterate these pause and reflect sessions they offer the opportunity to really take time to digest what we've just heard and connect it to our lives and have interactions on the zoom chat okay at this moment we kick off with our first presentation by mr samuel uh, we want to keep this event brief this event is meant to be the first of a series of discussions and interactions and community building around a single focus we all have the power and the ability to be builders of data-driven technologies and how can we move from consuming to building and in moving from consuming to building how can we create economic empowerment and opportunities for us and the communities that provide the data. We will have Mr. Samuel, who will take us on a very interesting presentation. And without much ado, Mr. Samuel, take it over. All right, so this is me here. Um, so I would be your co-host. So I'll be taking you through like a, a systematic way of doing like data business and what is data, I mean, understanding how to start, what do you, what do you need to start and stuff like that. Uh, but before then, I would like to start with, okay, how did I start to uh, pivot from just doing bachelor's in linguistics, so BA in linguistics, down to working at neurospace and cohere for AI? Uh, all right. Um, so essentially, I start uh, by learning linguistics as a typical Nigerian. I had my BA from University of Illinois, essentially. So um, it's not far-fetched. So I, I started learning linguistics. Uh, I started learning the basis of linguistics. I was shocked to know about the, the fact that we are not learning languages. We are learning uh, the underlying system of language. Uh, so so I, I did that, and I started learning how to use softwares. Uh, like um, Pratt, like Elan, like Flex, like many software. Uh, then I moved from just learning the software and I asked my one of my mentors, uh, I asked him, uh, he gave me the software and then I asked him, so what can I do? He said, okay, you have to, you have to save endangered languages, you have to document languages. So I started documenting languages. I will move to different communities. Uh, if you are very close to me, you know I go on the field trip a lot to go and document languages, you know, work playing around with data set. Um, so I understood the, the importance of having people to work on languages that are dying uh, in that climb. Uh, so after I learned about how to document languages, I learned how to automate my transcription like how to do transcripting, how to automatically segment document uh, uh, audios using Elan uh, and many other automate, automation I could get. 
so after I did those, I have my linguistic background. I started learning advanced stuff, you know, like systematically. So I moved to learning like Python. I moved to learning R, LaTeX, and some other programming languages. Um, so essentially, I wanted to just, I didn't want to learn like Python as a computer scientist. I wanted to learn Python and how to do data with Python, how to, how to do data in R, how to, you know, manipulate data and stuff like that. So, but uh, why I'm giving you this snippet is I want to explain how I triage for just doing the, uh, the theoretical linguistics, as you might have observed, that is very common among us to doing um, industrial works. So yeah, after I learned the the software, I learned linguistics, you need the linguistics. So don't let anybody uh, tell you, I mean, you need the, you need, you need a base because AI is an enterprise, right? Everybody comes with their commodity to sell and to buy. So if you leave your own product somewhere, nobody's going to buy from you because you're not, you don't have anything to sell. All right. So I understood this simple truth. So I, 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 I keep my linguistics background and I went to the industry. So yeah, um, so I started working. I, I worked in different places, but I've just, I've just mentioned a few. I volunteered. I started volunteering uh, as an annotator in different labs. I wrote to the labs. Okay, I am this, I am that. I would like to contribute to your labs. Okay, what do you bring to the table? I explained I have data experience. And stuff. Oh, wow, that's great. I was quick at transcribing data. I pick phonetic sounds really fast and I love to deal with tones. So I think those are my, I will tell you my edges. So I can I can pick different tone benches, uh, bent. Uh, I, I know high from low, low from super low, super low to super, super low and you know, back and forth. Uh, so I did some work with academic audio transcription in the UK. I was definitely like transcribing from just uh, audio down to eBooks, uh, like transcription and captioning and stuff like that. I worked at Neurospace as a data engineer. There I was just designing and creating data sets, evaluating models back and forth. Then the last one I did, if you've seen the video, is Cohere for AI, it was uh, I have data sets. And in that job, we did like um, a multilingual data set, which I, I was part of as a volunteer and as, you know, back and forth uh, working on the task. All right, so that is just like a, a, a snippet of how I started and how I got here. So that you would know that you're not, um, you're not alone in this journey. Everybody feels like, okay, I think I don't know anything at some point, or I think uh, I don't know what I'm gonna do with linguistics or because I studied, I studied biochemistry, I studied zoology. They said, okay, these jobs are, uh, they're not marketable and, you know, stuff like that. Um, so today, regardless of your background, what I'm going to be teaching is, um, <clears throat> you're going to, uh, what I'm going to be teaching is just going to be uh, data business as an abstract concept. And whatever field you study, whether you read Yoruba, you read Igbo, you read Swahili, you read Hamharic, you study linguistics, you study languages, you study whatever you study is going to be applicable. And uh, at the reflection point, as Chris mentioned, please stop by and uh, write in the chat. Uh, let me know if you have comments, you have questions. Uh, thank you. Let's kick start. All right. So data business. Uh, so this is the outline I have. Uh, I'm going to be talking about what is data, what is data business, samples of language problems, language factors affecting, influencing or affecting data business, samples of data business services that you may render, data business of unknown language, you don't have to know a language to do the business, data market, samples of data marketplaces, uh, what do I need to start, um, what do I need to start uh, the, the business? Um, and last note, and then we, we go to free questions. All right. So what is data business? I know, I know this is strange, right? 
All right, before we understand data business in itself, um, I would like to explain what data is. So data simply means language. So um, what is language? Representation of knowledge system of native speakers. Uh, the way you speak as uh, a Swahili speaker says a lot about the language that you speak or the culture that you communicate through the language that you speak. Uh, and I will just give an example. In Yoruba cos cosmology, uh, we have we don't have a third person pronoun for a reason. We don't have a third person pronoun because human being, the concept of human being is someone that can make a choice. And the person that, until the person can make a choice, in quotes, is not human enough. So we call, we say human being is someone that can make a choice. All right. And because it is someone that can make a choice, it's just blatant, right? It's not gender-based. It is anything, right? So it's different from English where you have the neutral, you have the male, male, male uh, grammatical male and grammatical female and back and forth. Uh, in Yoruba, it's, it's different. You see, that simple concept, it's not just language, it's not just words, it's, it's a communication of what we think or the way Yoruba speaker thinks the word is framed with, right? So the languages, they are the phrases, they are the words, the sentences. So uh, data is not, it's not uh, strange, it's not in the board, it's not in heaven, it's not hiding somewhere. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. You can see it anywhere and everywhere. So data, I'm talking to you and it is data. Okay. So in this kind of business, there are just three types of data types. We have the speeches, we have the text, and we have the multimodal. So the speech, as you know, it's just audio data set. The text is the textual data set. Multimodal is the combination, like the sign, it's it's reference and it's phonology. You know, when you when you sign, you use of you see people moving their mouth. Those things are correlating with the hands that you can see. Or in a case of Yoruba, where you have like a uh, tone that tone iconicity, iconicity in the sense that the high tone, the mid tone, and the low tone communicate to the sizes of objects. So you can have something like bembe, which is something that is very small. Bimbi, something that is mid, small, bimbi, something that is very big. So you see that the size is the same word, but different tones means different things, right? The high, high tone, the mid, mid tone, and the low, low tone. And it means small thing, it's more like smallest, smaller, small. The adjective gradation in that sense. So in that case, you know, you have like the, the audio, that is bimbi, right? So you are trying to pick the audio sound and you're trying to annotate the text and you're trying to map that to a reference in terms of the sizes, right? That is a multimodal uh, data set. And of course, it's very rare. Uh, it's very, it's, it's very rare, uh, but these are, these are the type of data set you'll be dealing with if you are dealing with uh, data business. All right, so we have language, and language is data, right? So the language that you speak, if you are a native speaker of any language, the language that you speak, uh, it's the data that you need to do your business with. All right, so now moving from the language to business. So the business is a language data solution company with the sole aim of solving an intended problem within the language industry. So it is important to know that the business, the language business is defined in the problem that the business is designed to do. So the solutions you are providing to the industry shapes, define, explain, tells what you do with the business. So the business is not far-fetched. It's not Tony Elimelo, you want to be like Elon Musk or you want to be Mark Zuckerberg. That is not, that's not the starting point. The starting point is understanding that the business of data is the problem that the data is designed to solve. 
it is not equal to language as a product companies, but language as a product company is part of the data business. And we will see the sample uh, services that you can render. So language is the sole object in this case, and it is the market. It is the, co it is the commodity that you are selling. Data is the commodity you are selling. Buy and selling of data, mitigating between different problems that is with data set. Now, because a language is not spoken in vacuum, a language is spoken because it has native speakers. The native speakers are the communities that speak these languages, and they are the stakeholders and dealers in this data marketplace. So the data marketplace is a place where you sell data set. We would see examples, but the communities are the stakeholders. And you see, the tragedy is that somebody just nab you from the roadside and ask you to develop data set for them, and you are not aware. And then they go on to sign like a treaty and begin to make like thousands and thousands of dollars on this data set, which you have unknowingly given to them. Because the knowledge system is what they need. And the more we give machine the knowledge system, the better we serve humanity. Because any AI product that is designed to work against human is not designed in the, on this earth because every human computer interaction or computer human interaction is aimed at mitigating between the differences between what humans are doing and what machines are doing. You can imagine your phone at some point trying to run away from you when you're trying to pick it. So you just move closer to it and it's moving away. You move closer and it's moving away. You know that this problem is not for you. This phone is not yours because your phone should be closer to you, right? So if your phone is doing what you don't expect it to do, you, you get worried. Sometimes you see an icon on your phone. I don't know that you have parents, but I know I, I know I have parents where they would see an icon on their phone. They would tell you, help me to remove it. Remove it from my phone. Remove it from my phone. It's not doing anything to your phone. It's just simple thing. They say, no, it's, 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 remove it from my phone. Remove it from my phone, you know? So this simulation between computer and humans is why we are creating this product. You see why the communities are the consumers. So if the cons community are the consumers, they are the stakeholders because without the data, as Chris mentioned, there is no product. In the AI business, we rely on data. No data, no product. All right, so what are the samples of data problems? You know, I explained that, um, and this is very related to Mr. Chris's question. I explained that you design the data business based on the problems you identified and based on the solutions you are providing to that problem, right? Okay, um, so the first problem I'm talking about is representations. Um, Dr. Uh, Mr. Chris mentioned perfectly well, we have inadequate linguists and native speakers in the field. And this is true. This is true. And why do we have that? Because many do not have the required skill set. That is just the, uh, that is the, that is the, that is the representational problem that we have. So how can you solve this problem? Uh, acquiring more skills. So what kind of skills do you need? We would see that later in the presentation. So the representations are lagging, not because people don't know as such as people don't even, people have heard of it, of it but they don't have the skill set to do it. So uh, the most popular that you see around the continent is translation and interpretation service. That is not the only thing you do in data business. I have done different projects on data set collection and it has been a good blessing to me uh, I, I remember I collected data set for a lab and they just needed me to, to translate to, to get some English sentiment data set. It was, it was a lot of money and I didn't do anything AI. I didn't do anything transcription or translation. I just invested the data for them. Just go here and collect sentiment analysis data set. As simple as that. 
All right, so there are different services you, you can render and it is, does not have to do with having the technical in quote skills. All right, so the representation problem is that people lack skills and motivation to start. All right, orthography. So one problem with orthography, uh, we don't have keyboards that handle our languages. I remember I was working at a, uh, at a company and we had a lot of challenges trying to type Yoruba alphabet. And they tell me, just use that. And I kept telling them, if you use that, Yoruba is not only heavily orthographically driven, it is heavily tonal. So a word like B-A has no meaning to a Yoruba speaker if you don't pronounce it or you tomac it. If you don't tomac it, I don't know what you're saying. So the orthography system, it's not only about the writing. It's the fact that even the ones that are written are not written properly. And I know even if you if you go on the web and crawl at BBC News, you see they don't tomac their work. It has no meaning for a language that is heavily tomac like Igbo, like Yoruba, you can't pick those languages without tomacking it. So one problem is that we don't have representative data set that represent the knowledge system of the language. I'm gonna give you a simple example. Uh, I, I discovered a problem uh, in a data set, the, this big company that I wanted to work on a, on a project and I was there to volunteer, I mean, just being a good boy. So when I saw the data, I told them that when you have a verb and a vowel after the verb in Yoruba, most likely that vowel is a clitic and it's the object of the sentence. So if I have a sentence like O, Bam, Olu, so O is a third person, Ba is to meet up, Olu is a person. So he met Olu or he caught up with Olu. Now, if I reduce the Olu into a clitic, a clitic is like a, it's like a morphine, a morphine like a, 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 a vowel or a syllable that is just hanging somewhere in the sentence, contributing to the meaning of the word. I can tell you like Oba, so I extend the Ba at the end and copy the vowel. So in the all throughout the digital set, they had the R joining with the with the, with the bar, for example, which means that they've already joined the object of the sentence with the verb of the sentence because they are not aware, right? And when I told them that this sentence is, is this, this word you call a word, it's a sentence and it's not a word. You really have to separate this R from that R. Why? Because these are problems that people are not thinking about. And if you misrepresent a language, machine does not care. Right? If you tell machine blue is pink and pink is blue, machine say, yes, I, I, captain. And he keeps doing that. He knows nothing about what you're trying to say and he cares less about it because it takes input from you. Whatever you tell it, it learns. So if you misrepresent a language, if you don't cater for the tone system, if you don't cater for every nuances of the language, then you are so changing not just yourself, but you are so changing and representing your knowledge system. Remember, data is not just a list of sentences. Data is a means of communication. It is the language that we use to express our feelings, our understanding, our knowledge system. Nobody can open your head and see why would a Yoruba speaker prostrate? I know people have asked this kind of question. Why? Because Yoruba is heavily heavy on honor. You can't disrespect anybody anyhow. In fact, it's so big that we have it in our pronoun system. Our pronoun system has both disrespect or neutral and respect. You got to show the respect anywhere you see yourself. So the prostration that you see, it's not just there to express how we are prostrating as a man, but it's there to show that we are we 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 place value on respect. So. Data is what? Representation of knowledge system of native speaker. Now we have knowledge gap. Um, there are no peers. There are few peers of, um, of data sites in the continent. Um, you know, I've, I've asked 
many people ask me, uh, Samuel, what is the what is the solution to the data to the languages in Africa? And I do tell them that, in my opinion, I don't want you to uh to agree with me, but I think that if we invest in Swahili, we would move faster. I think AU has standardized it, and I've said that a long time ago. And the point is, the language has contribution to the kind of thing that you do. I would see that after this slide. But we need to invest on a language that can show that other languages. We need someone that translates from Swahili to Igbo, from Swahili to Ewe, from Swahili to Akan, Akan to Swahili, because we focus a lot on these big languages. But these big languages don't focus on us. So most times you see a model or you see a product going from English to Yoruba, English to Akan, English to Swahili, Swahili to English. Have you seen models going from Swahili to Hausa, for example, or from Swahili to Fula, or from Swahili to Amharic, Amharic to Swahili, Yoruba to Igbo? Because you see, the language family of this, the language families or the languages and their families are related. So a Niger Congo language, it's related as far as as far as Bantu languages like Isiz Isizulu is, it's related to Yoruba than Hausa, because Hausa is a Semitic language. Hausa will most likely be related to Arabic, Arabic and Hebrew. You see, now if you if you have uh, a, a model that is going from English to Yoruba and you are trying to use that to model what happens to Igbo and Hausa or Igbo and Yoruba, if as related as Igbo and Yoruba is, you are making a big mistake because the knowledge gap is too wide. It's too wide because these languages behave differently. Not only that, they behave differently by being different in, this, in different language families. So we need a model. We need data businesses that to say, okay, we are doing these languages and this is the way we sell. I, I will explain how you can sell in that climb. Now, transcription, annotation, and collection. Uh, we need a lot of skillful people that know how to collect authentic, in quote, data set. Many people collect data. They record on their phone. They do annotation. Few people understand why. For example, I am a, uh, I'm into sound. If you know me well, I deal with sound. When I'm sad, just play music. When I'm happy, play me music. When I'm when I'm anywhere, just give me sound. Anything sound, I'm 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 fine. So I care a lot about the quality of the audio I hear. And I'm gonna give you a good example. When you convert from WAV to MP3, which is what many people do, you just want to record in MP3. What happens is that you have an audio that has fine-tuned your format values. And the format values are the representation of the sound waves you have. So, uh, is it for, uh, because of the form. We can hear you now. Oh, you were I'm breaking so up a bit, but oh, sorry about we can that. hear you now. Okay, thank you. All right, so with that, without, without letting people that understand the collection of these data sets do their job, knowing when to set your gain when you're recording, the type of thing you want to collect, the cultural representation of the language. Language is not just words. I keep saying it. Language is a culture. Language is the way we think. Language inf language shapes the way we think. It's not the way we think, but it shapes how we view the world. Uh, I remember uh, the first time I would leave uh, Nigeria to meet another person who is older than me. You know what I, I was asking myself, how do I show respect to this man? How do I show appreciation? A typical Yoruba person like me would prostrate and say, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. He doesn't really care, right? It's from different culture. So I was asking myself, so how do I tell this person? Do you know how I could have shown my appreciation? I would have bought him like a flower and imagine that you have like a typical African parent and you want to show him or her uh, that you appreciate that he paid your money or he gave you some money and you bought flour. And then you just said, that is your flour. I mean, do you know how bizarre that sounds to an African parent? You want to go far and wide and begin to, you know, praise them because that is the way we view the world. 
and a data set that refuse to incorporate these things into their model is not our system because it's not representing us. All right, apart from the collection, we annotation takes time. We need a lot of personnel that can show the data annotation progress. This annotation system, annotation is time consuming. So if you are into annotation business, you can add source, right? You can, you can talk to different companies and network yourself around and let them know what you do. I bet you will get, I, I, when I was into annotation, I did a lot of annotation jobs from audio to transcription, transcription to phonetic, phonetic transcription and back and forth. So you can see we have like these four problems, these four huge problems that I've taken my time to explain. So what are the factors, what are the language factors influencing data business? So what are the factors you need to consider if you want to do a language business, a data business? So what are the, I, I have made it language specific because I know people will be asking, now I speak Swahili, I did Yoruba, I did Amharic, who knows these languages? I don't speak French, I don't speak English, I don't do that. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, Language vitality is the first thing I want to talk about. You see, language vitality is one thing we don't take care of. You know, I mentioned Swahili earlier on. So the language vitality determines how many profits you would, or how much of profit you would make when you are in business. I would give a, a typical example. Imagine you want to create a product that only 50 people can use. And you want to create a product that 1 million people can use, please, which of the products would you do? More money for you, right? If you do 1 million people, you have 1 million profit. So if, if 1 million people do your product, at least you have like 500 minimum using the product. So if you have $1, one dollar every month on one person, that is $500, 500K, right? But if you have like 50 people and you keep doing, nobody will do business, right? So the vitality of the language matters a lot. And that is why you cannot afford to let your language die like smoke. The more people we have using and speaking our languages, the bigger the vitality. So the vitality is the speaker base. So for example, someone that would create a product for Yoruba would think twice when he has an option of Swahili. Because if you look at the number of people speaking Swahili, it's bigger than Yoruba, right? The countries are bigger. The, the, the space is bigger, right? It means that if I create a product in Yoruba and I create a product in Swahili, I will most likely be selling more in Swahili than I will sell in Yoruba. So the number of people, so you can't blame Facebook and say, okay, Facebook is not even paying attention to Amharic. It's not paying attention to Kiarwanda. It's not paying attention to uh, uh, it's not paying attention to uh, Yoruba. It's not paying attention to Igbo, right? Now, the vitality, the language vitality, is the speaker base. So, how many people we consume this product? Now, the fact that you created a a business or a data business in Swahili doesn't mean that all Swahili speaker would use it, right? So you might have a Swahili speaker or you might have a company in Germany using the product you created, even though they are not speakers of Swahili, right? But the bottom line is we want to consider the usability. So who are the, 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 the base of the people that would use the language we are working on will determine how far we go in the business. So. Uh, this is one factor. The second factor is the resources. So a standardized language would have more influence than unstandardized language. You don't have to take this to heart. This is a reality, right? So for example, at English, we keep having a larger product than African languages. And African languages that are standardized, we have more hopes than the ones that are dying. So we really have to find a way to mitigate this. And this is why we have the problems, right? So these are the language thing, the language factors you have to consider when you are starting a business, right? So 
you want to start out with, okay, I have this language. We need to represent the language in this AI driven world. How do I do it? So how do I, how do I move a language that is spoken in, let's say, southern part of Nigeria that nobody knows on this Zoom to a language that will be used by Facebook? Uh, well, that is another discussion for another time, okay? But the point I'm trying to drive at is these are the language factors, not any other factor. These language-specific factors influencing data business. Um, the niche. So what kind of niche or what kind of language parallel data set, for example, do you have? Um, for example, someone that created a data set in colloquial speech would sell less than someone that created a data set in health or tech or tech education, right? Why? Because it's domain specific. The terms are not easy to come by. You need to do a lot of terminological development. You need to do a lot of uh, work to make sure that you are producing the right terms at the right time. So imagine I have like a parallel data set that is, I am going home. I will see you. What is your name? I will talk to you tomorrow. You know, like these phone conversations, those are colloquial speeches, right? And a data set that deals with, I know coronavirus has nitrogen, hydroxide, and, you know, and back and forth, you know, these terminologies. And I'm trying to bring that from English to Yoruba or to Hausa or to Igbo or to so Helio, to whatever, whatever language I'm working on, people will invest in that than the colloquial speech. For one reason, because the, the niche tells a lot about the business that you do. So think about the vitality of the language and how you can use, how you can use bigger vitality to drive uh, smaller ones. So, uh, you know, I mentioned Swahili. So if you really want to drive the business, I guess we might want to invest in Swahili and power Swahili with Ausa, power Ausa with Yoruba and, you know, and then power that with Oromo, with Hamharic, and then you go back and forth. You remember I mentioned that we need language data business that focuses more on African languages in going between these languages and considering their different language families, Niger Congo language is different from Niger Kondofenia, is different from afro asiatic and you know, and looking at how the models perform overlapping among these uh, language families. Uh, so what are the sample of services for data business? So now that you've learned, okay, I know that data is knowledge system, it's data set, it's language, phrases, words, sentences, and I've learned that I would define the business of data is defining the problems that the data business is defined to solve. So the solutions are the sample of services, right? So we have data set creation. Um, so the first, what kind of service can you render here? So you really want to understand the ethical consideration. Africa continent as a whole is very complex. And I speak from experience. Uh, some communities, they tell you, you can't talk to us. You really have to talk to our chiefs, right? You, no, nobody can do it like an African, I bet you. Nobody can go to an African community without an insider. Few people can navigate, you know, you. it's in an African continent, someone will laugh at you. And they don't really mean you laugh at, back at them. They don't want you, right? They're just smiling. To, to to you know to 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 release to reduce the tense in the environment they don't they don't want you right so these guys are aware so they they use us and you know use and don't just collect data and go right so we need business owners that will stand the ground and consider the ethical consideration of this data set so what are the ethical considerations so who are the participants we are you collecting the data what do you want to use the data to do? What is the usefulness? Uh, explain what you want to use the data to do. Explain why you are doing it. You have to sign with the chiefs. Talk to the people in the community. Talk to language consumers. Create data sets. So data set creation is talking about the quality of the data, the content of the data, the types and tokens in the data set. What kind of things do you want to consider 
as ethics that is influencing your data, our data set collection. And we have data transcription and closed captioning. I've not even seen, I've seen a lot of people doing data transcription services, but I've not seen the one that is, that is top notch. Maybe we have been to. I've been working in this particular industry for some time. I can tell you that um, transcription is beyond just sitting down and typing. You, you can use software to scale your work and edit it and even translate within the scale. So for example, if you give the lecture I'm giving or the teaching I'm giving now, if I want to convert that into an ebook, it is possible in transcription and closed captioning business. Do you know that Nollywood in Nigeria is one of the biggest movie industry and we still struggle to do closed captioning? Subtitling, you can call it subtitling, you know? Because we have less businesses. We have less people doing this stuff. Few hands are full. I did closed captioning sometimes in 2015. That was the first job I would do in, in, in Nigeria. After I did that job, it was like a movie captioning. After I did that job, I could not rest. I to, I, and I had to go to school, right? I had to, you know, tell people I'm not into this. I just did that as a one-time thing, right? Because the I don't know how the industry is now in terms of the number of people that they want, but I know the industry has grown and we need more people in this space. And you can talk to different producers. So I've known, I know a company presently that reached out to me and said, okay, well, we are doing this thing for different thing. Can you give us feedback, you know, on this product you are developing on closed captioning? And here we are in Africa, we are not even aware. There is no captioning. There is the fact that movie transcend cultures. I have seen Aosa movies, I've seen Swahili movies, I've seen, you, you watch Korean movies, right? Because Korean movies trans, uh, translate, right? They translate on closed captioning. You can see how fast that is. If you watch, there is this one that they do in Philippines. I don't I don't see those kind of movies anyway. Uh, you, you see that they, they have like transcription and the audio, everything properly worked on. And it's a different language and we all watch it, right? Because the closed captioning industry are doing a great job. Data translation and interpretation. Um, I will not talk more on this because I think many people are aware so definitely like you have interpretation services, you have translation services. Uh, many gigs I've got in this kind of atmosphere and this kind of niche is mitigating between people in court. Uh, many people going to court, seek asylums. Some people are in trouble. They don't speak English well. They don't speak, they speak Hausa. They speak Yoruba. They speak one language or the other. They need interpreters. And you know, traditionally in many African churches too, you have interpreters, right? Uh, that you interpret for the speaker, you interpret for the preacher. These are services. These are services. They are not just there, right? People pay huge amount of money to do these things that we do freely, right? I'm not saying you, you begin to task your church uh, for, for interpreting. I'm, I'm just saying that this is an industry. So you, we need more hands that interpret, that understand the language of interpretation that understand translation that goes in the borders. For example, someone that goes from Arabic, Sudanese Arabic, for example, to Egyptian Arabic, Egyptian Arabic to Jordan Arabic, Arabic to Abu Dhabi Arabic. And you know, they seem to be the same language, but they are not because they are in different space. So language varies by space and shapes, right? So we need more people in this service. Data archiving and language preservation, right? Uh, there are different companies that fund you to do archiving jobs. The ELA is there. You can see the website. The, there's a Ninja Language Project, Documentation Project. And there's ELP, Ninja Language Project. That is Firebrand. Um, I think Firebrand do more of like poetic or artistic work. Like if you render poems in your language, they can fund you. They can fund you pretty well to do this stuff. Uh, so these are the services. And we have less people. You will discover that you go to an African conference and many Africans are not Africans enough. I mean that 90% of people in that conference are not even speakers of African languages. And they are there. 
working on our languages because perhaps we refuse to do that or we refuse to see the opportunity in our languages. So data archiving retriever uh, representation, very important because not only would archiving promote our languages, archiving will help to preserve the authenticity of our knowledge system as native speakers of these languages. Of course, data annotation. Um, so yeah, data annotation is just labeling data sets using different means. You can do part of speed tagging. You can do name entity recognition. You can do sentiment analysis. You can do social sentiment and emotional tagging. So I want to talk on maybe social sentiment. I have never seen a good work that do social sentiment. Uh, social sentiment is simply, uh, you know, in African settings, we pay a lot of attention to our community. We are not as individualistic. So because we have that, we have the social ethics. We have the sentiment. Uh, uh, like uh, when somebody tells you, uh, if you if you ask someone, what English we call rhetoric question? Uh, can I can I slap your face? And the person said, you should slap it and see what happens. That comes with a tone. That comes with facial expression. That comes with different body languages. The embodies of these things are not just there. They are there to communicate that statement in that context, right? So if I said, I will slap you, I say, slap it. And then you go ahead to slap the face. You know, you're in trouble. Africans don't mean what they say and they don't say what they mean. You really have to understand the context the situation, the body language, and different things that you that you want to um, consider. So emotional tagging, the emotions attached to it. Uh, I know, I know, many times people die in different African contexts. There are different ways they mourn, right? Uh, somebody that would say. Uh, I mean, th there are different ways they do this thing. I, I don't want to start, start sounding <laughs> somehow, but emotions attached to speeches, John Con mood. You, you remember when you, we did poem, right? In high schools, they tell you what is the mood of the speaker uh, in that kind of despair, joy, excitement, you know, in that uh, kind of way. Uh, this thing is, uh, you, you need to really understand what we are saying in our context to understand what we are doing. Now we are going into like the last section, some science, uh, data business for unknown language. So the question is, how do I, how do I do data business? Now I must say the more language you can deal with, right? The bigger your fund, isn't it? But I am a native speaker of many, language Nigerian languages. I don't speak Hamharic. I don't speak Isikosa. I don't speak, I mean Zulu. So and I have like a client who contacted me and said, okay, now we have this project. Um how do I how do I and they said it's in Zulu. And I would say I don't speak this language. You don't do that in business. In business there is a way. Now, an unknown language is a language you don't speak. It's not that it is strange. It is not weird. It is not in heaven. It is on earth. And it is in Africa mostly. Right? So how can you do business with a language that you don't speak? So unknown here, don't take it to heart. It's just mean a language you don't speak or no, you don't have any knowledge about the language. Um... Before I explain the steps, I would share a gig I had. So there was a time I had a gig to deal with, uh, to collect a data set. You know, as linguists or as a linguist, we have uh, upper hand in terms of documenting understudied languages. So we have International Phonetic Alphabet, an alphabet that is based on speech to speech, writing to speech transcription. So you write what you say, you, you write what you sound. Right, like you sound the writing. You don't, you don't go like 
letters. You write the the phonet the phones. Um, so because of that, we have the leverage to go from the sound you hear and reduces the orthography. So I had this very big and wonderful gig. So I went to a village, uh, they needed a language. Okay, essentially they were working on understanding the topography. It, it was like an elf. It was earth and climate, something. They wanted to know the number of the depth of the river and you know, understand the cosmos of the, of the setting. But they needed to put those things in their native languages and they need those things to be written. And the language is not even studied. So they hired me and they said, okay, yeah, we have this and that, you know. Then we went to the village and it was a very, imagine a gig you would get and you'd be paid like one era or one dollars. And then uh, you, get a, you get a gig and you are paid $20. You see that? Like times 19 of what you would get naturally because this is an unknown language. So unknown language can actually be understood in language and it can be a language that you don't speak. And the more you pair these languages, the more language you have under your umbrella, the bigger your business, right? I mean, the more products, more funds. So essentially, what did I do? All right, so I started by researching about the language. Okay, I don't know this language, I don't know it's spoken, I don't know who the speakers are, Wikipedia is there, right? So I started by understanding what work have been done on this language if no works have been done on this specific language, do we have a neighboring language? Do we have data set on a neighboring language that I know that, for example, uh, if I know that there is a language in A and the native speakers are B, but B speaks A, right? I can get the data set in A, in B, and ask them to translate to A. For example, some Eastern languages like Tanzania, they have their local languages, but they speak Swahili. So if you are working, if you get a gig and say, okay, we want to do this language, I know very well that these people speak Swahili, so I can ask them, okay, I have a Swahili data set, can you translate to these local languages, making sure naturalness is taken into consideration and, you know, back and forth. I already solved the problem, right? Um, Another thing I could do is to make sure that I understand the name of the language because the name of the language is very important. If you don't know the name of the language, you can't even research about the language. So if you know the name of the language, you can start by understanding the resources that are on the language. And Lamfrica is there. Lamfrica, on Lamfrica platform, you can search for different resources. You can search for a language and its data and try to look for the specific data and see a very closely related language and try to get native speakers for the language. So you have to start creating the data set and the annotation process. So now once you identify uh, the language, you've identified the native speakers, you identify where you would get them. Um, you will start to recruit people, right? So uh, you talk to people, you write up the consent, you get their consent, you explain to them the project, you explain what you want to do, you explain the data sets, and back and forth, right? Um, when you create the annotation process, make sure your rubrics are clear. Make sure not only clear, but simple. Simple for an illiterate to understand. So it's more of thinking, it's more of devising means, and that is why we need business, right? Because you can't imagine a CEO of uh, Facebook, for example, to be thinking about recruiting people. What does he need? He needs the output, right? He needs the data set. How you are collecting and the 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 behind the scene work. It's your business that would do it, right? So they don't they care. It's not as if they don't care. They do care, it's just that that is not the purpose of their collection, right? That's not the purpose of their, they, they wanna do business. They don't care about, they, they care, but not as much as you care because they are different aims, right? Um, you have to select the pipeline for your data collection. So for example, when I got there, I, I talked to, I've read about it, 
right? I networked myself and said, okay, you're from this local government. You're from this country. I am from this particular part of the country. Do you know these people? Okay, I said, yes. Okay, do you know people that speak this language? I said, yes. And then, you know, I had to link, link in that pipeline. And of course, at that different point, I had to acknowledge them, uh, you know, appreciate them for their time, give them some money, um, talk to them about my project, let them understand why I'm here. Managing the expectations. You don't just go to a community and tell them, okay, uh, we are just collecting data set to document it, and then you end up building like a speech data set, a speech product from it. That is against the ethics of the research. If you are doing a product, let them know. If you are not sure yet, and where you put the data set, let everything be clear. Explain everything you want to do. And then you will start by collecting data sets. I think we would talk about this in another video on how to build data set for machines, for NLP projects, and you know, for, for AI, not just collecting data sets for documentation purpose, right? So um, when you have the tools you're using to collect your data set, collect data set. Now you have to train native speakers on how to collect data set. So that is what we call community engaged collection. So you train the community, pick like five or six people, they go naturally to the settings and collect fantastic data sets for you. That is faster, that is easier, that is, it's easier to communicate to those people to communicate to people through those people, right? Like the other native speakers. So that is how you can establish the pipeline. So when you are doing the annotation process, so you would have the reviewers and the lead reviewer. So if you, for example, recruit data set collectors, if you have like 10 persons, you look at their proficiency level, you would, you would, you would see in the way they are handling those things. You would, you would have guessed, right? You can ask them. So among them, you make you make them the reviewer. So you have reviewers among them. Then you have the lead reviewer who will cap everything, and then tell you how authentic is it is. Now most of the time, what I do is I don't work with people that I know. So if I'm recruiting like A, B, C, uh, D, E, F would not know I recruited them, and G, H, I would not know I recruited them. So different people at different time, different recruitment, different talks. They are doing different things so that the, 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 the reviewer process and the authenticity of the data set will be checked and everybody will work in anonymized. So you don't know, I, I was asking A to review B. You don't know B to review A, right? So everybody is on check, just making sure everybody is on the, the same page, right? And then when I'm creating the annotation process, that is the same thing I do. So if I recruited like 10 people for annotation, I will make sure like three will be review, uh, will be my reviewers. One lead reviewer, two reviewers. So from the annotators who are five, I map them to two people. And then from the two people, I map them to one person, depending on the size of the project. So you are the one there recruiting people. You are the one coordinating these things. You are the one researching about the language. They are doing their work. They are doing their business. You can have them as a short term. You can have them as a long term. You can ask them, have them as interns. You can have them as uh, uh, collaborators, right? It depends on the nature of the project, the duration, and how much you plan to invest in it. The one I said I did, it was about six months. So it was like contractual system and i i did my job submitted the product described the language translated the content they wanted to drive from the community and submitted the project right so um that is how to do business with a language you don't know um yeah so you have to establish collaborations now, because you are dealing with an unknown language, you must have community-based collection procedures because if you want a natural data, you don't want a translated data. You don't want an interpreted data because the knowledge of a language is 
very difficult to transcribe, to translate into a different language. So if all your data sets are based on translation, I bet you have a long way to go because it's not representative of the knowledge, the native speaker's knowledge. Uh, for that reason, the best thing for you is to make it community engaged. So when you go to the community and you've explained yourself, uh, talk to the people you are talking to, like choose among them, choose at different time and uh, make sure that everything is well spelled out. Consenting, very, very important. What are the ethical considerations you want to consider? You want to anonymize the names, you want to redact some statements, you want to do, I mean, you want to do a lot of things. Just a fun fact, if you are doing a linguistic analysis, have you observed that most of the bad words or curse words or inappropriate words are the ones that have the paradigms you're looking for? I have observed that. Many bad words I don't want to say among people are the ones that would have the specific things I was looking for. And then I wonder, how do I elicit these words? We'll talk about that some other time. Okay, so you have to discuss with the stakeholders. What are the, who are the stakeholders? They are not business, they are not uh, Elon Musk, they are the communities, the people you are dealing with. These are the stakeholders. Let them know your project. Explain it to them, don't hide anything from them. Archiving and reusability. Make sure you have an archiving plan. So archiving is not just storing the data. Archiving is a process of systematically creating metadata, meta descriptive data for your data set. So there's something they call data statements. Uh, yeah, I think this woman in University of Washington, I can't remember her name. Um, oh my, Emily Bender. Bender. Emily Bender, yeah. Emily Bender was part of people that devised these things. Um, a data statement is just a statement that explains the archiving, the metadata, the reusability, the consenting and everything about the data set. It doesn't necessarily have to be the data itself. It is just the, the factors governing how this data set should be used, who should use it, why you should use it. Is it open source? Is it this and that? So, um, if you do, you need to create a data statement. So this is where your archiving and reusability comes in. And you can see platform like Lamfrica. You can check Lamfrica, uh, Lamfrica and uh, check about the, the data that they have, read about the consent. Don't just pick data for no reason. Read the documentation of the data if you are using an existing data set. All right. Ah, um, yeah. So what is the market? Where are the markets? Yes, there are data markets. So if I am a freelancer and I am trying to sell a data set um, and essentially um, looking for a place to sell. So, you know, the market. So the market is, as you know, a market. Remember that data is the commodity, right? So you are looking for a market to sell your data. So data market, a market is a place where buying and selling of course. Being the market, you are as well to bring something with you, which is language. So essentially there is no monolingual person, right? There is no true monolingual person. It has been argued. Um, so um, when you are building uh, something to the market, make sure you bring something. Remember the niche, the vitality, the resources, right? These are the things you are bringing to the market, considering those things. So uh, data market is the place where you sell your data set. You can buy data sets from there. So what are the sample data set that we, platform that we have here? We have Monda, so you can see this is their website. You can go there. You would have to download their white paper demo and contact them to upload your data set. So you can put your data set there and begin to sell. They contact you, they pay you, you keep selling back and forth, that simple. Data, uh, data raid, um, it seems they are in partner with Monda in some sense, uh, but you would, you would, 
submit to them, they would upload it, but you would have a link to track the progress of the data. And this is the link for you to assess the data company. Taos used to be a very big data marketplace. Uh, I think they shut down now. They shut down the marketplace this year, April this year. I don't know. I think they moved to something better, but Taos data marketplace used to be really, I worked a lot on Taos data marketplace and I saw a lot on Taos data marketplace. So uh, just something to consider when you are uploading to the marketplace. Number one, you remember the niche. So uh, consider that vitality is very important. And how do you explain vitality? So for example, if I am a native speaker of Akan, and I want to sell data set on Akan and English, hmm, that might not move as much as someone that decides to say, okay, I know French is bigger and Portuguese is bigger. So I'm gonna get someone that will translate my data set from English to Portuguese, Portuguese to French, and I translate it to Akan. So you see, I have like three languages. In my case, what I've done in the past is to translate from English to uh, Portuguese, Portuguese to French, French to Yoruba, Yoruba to Hausa. And yeah, it was a huge uh, payment. So how do you pay people in that way? So what we do is, okay, if we sell this data set, this amount, we sign an agreement, memorandum of understanding. I'm going to give you this percentage. I'm going to take this percentage and you can like this number. It's that simple. And everybody gets their share. So uh, the way we set it up was, uh, was was it star, uh, Paystack also? Or was it Flutter? No, it wasn't Flutter. It was Paystack, I think. So then we use Pioneer where when everything gets paid, everybody gets their share and that was it. Uh, in fact, some we only talk once and we never talk again. We, we were just getting our money. That was on Taos Data Marketplace. I was cool, was good. Um, yeah, another thing you have to consider the format. So if you are doing like a parallel copra, most of the time, if you look at transition systems like Omega T, they have a specific format. That file format is what you would have to submit because it, it might not be PDF, most likely it's not PDF because machine is a number, right? The representation, of those numbers matters a lot to machine. It might not matter to you, but it matters a lot to machine. Um, so yeah, you really have to consider different file. Maybe we'll talk about different uh, files and handling different files and converting different files uh, later on in another series. Um, so this is all about uh, data marketplace. Now, what do I need to start? Now you have made a lot of noise. Everybody, okay, we have heard you. What do I need to start? Good question. So do you speak or know any human language? I know either sign or spoken or text. This is most likely yes, and that is all that you need. Now, what is your domain of study? Are you a finance person? Are you a linguist? Are you a tech person? Are you a health person? Are you a teacher? That is all that you need. So, and I'm gonna tell you a very fantastic way to combine these things. Um, suppose I am a teacher and I speak Hausa and I speak English, voila. I have data set, educational data set. For example, the, the words that are very domesticated to education would need to be translated to teach machine, right? Would need to be there curated for people. For example, the educational system in Nigeria, I'm sure it's not the same thing as Ghana. It's not the same thing as Sierra Leone. It's not the same thing as Rwanda. Not something as Kenya, not something as Ethiopia, right? At different countries with different niches and different types, words, right? So if I am a teacher and I want to be data set to sell 
okay, well, I can start by saying, okay, I want to create domain-specific data set. That is educational domain words, tokens, speech, expressions, only in education, like pupils. Pupils to a doctor is the I, right? Pupils to a teacher is student, isn't it? Many people are aware of the fact that education is very important. So if we would cater for education, we need machines. If you read chemistry, you want to have data set in chemistry. Fantastic. Create all chemistry papers, all educational papers, all finance papers. Put it into different software. We will talk about that some other time, like Antcon, get the types and the tokens. Types is the unique word in your data. Tokens are all the, all the words. So you count type ones, you count tokens, many times, as much as it's represented in your data set. Types are very important for machines to learn new connections. Tokens are very important to learn the reinforcement of the new connection. So take it as I am learning something with a type. I would, I would reinforce that thing repeatedly with a token. All right. So let's say I want to do that. I will just get the words and I will translate them to English or the number of language I'm speaking. And I make them into a parallel corpora, upload on this platform, and wait for what God is gonna do, or I wait for what my head is gonna choose to do. So, more so if you have identified a problem. Now, we've talked about a lot of things, right? You must have been seeing different problems. Imagine uh, uh, impaired people, imagine deaf people, imagine blind people, imagine uh illiterate uh people that don't speak english imagine your grandparents your grandpas in the village who knows nothing about ai and wants to sell their product imagine your farmers imagine your your mechanic on the roadside imagine these people getting ai incorporated into their day-to-day -day activities and i would pause on this note on Artisans, imagine fashion designers. Have you seen data sets on those? Fashion designers, uh, cobblers, shoemakers, uh, seamstress, and whatever thing. They have different terms, they have words. If you are an artisan and you don't really go to school, voila, it's all good, right? I know the words. I know everything about this kind of measurement. Maybe I'm a seamstress or I'm a fashion designer. I can create these words, translate them to the languages I speak, saw them. Maybe I'm a Forex trader. I know different terms in Forex or I trade Bitcoin. I have different terms in these things, right? I have the knowledge, so it doesn't have to be a field. I get these words. I create data set with them. I translate the data set. I upload a platform. I serve as an intermediary between different companies. I show interest in the annotation. That is how you start begin and just start start it's that simple and it's that important so last note uh i just want to shout it as loud as you want to hear it you're welcome adebola data is a commodity data is what a commodity a commodity is bought and sold as natural resources. Data is a what? A commodity, a commodity that you buy and you sell as natural resources. Let that sink systematically, a data. So tell yourself data, my speech, you know what data is? It's a commodity and I buy and sell it as natural resources. If you refute the idea of monetizing your native knowledge, you will not only debar the world of the beauty of your language in promoting multi-ethnicity and the beauty of different worldviews, you will also not have control over the products that are built by others who use your languages. I will take that statement again. If you refuted the idea of monetizing your native knowledge, your language, you will not only debar the word of the beauty of your language in promoting multi-ethnicity and the beauty of differing worldviews, you will also not have control over the product that are built 
by others who use your languages. Think knowledge through data, make a living. In closing this event, I want to bring us back to this slide. This slide encapsulates the core of what we are trying to do with this event and in the future. In summary, it's about empowering people to go from consumers of data-driven technologies to builders of data-driven technologies. Uh, when you are a builder, you are creating data. So you are creating data and creating data could come in different ways. It could be through the services that you offer. So your translation, transcription, annotation, it could come through the services you offer. It could also come through the projects that you, that you create. So it's about being data builders in our data-driven world. And the, this presentation focused more on the economic potential. In addition, there are other potentials in terms of um, you know, um, preserving an endangered language and other things. Mahatma Gandhi, there's a nice quote he said. He says, be the change you want to see in the world. In our data-driven digital world, I transform that quote into something that looks like this. It says, build the data for the change you want in your world. So if you look at your world right now and you see, oh, there aren't many, you know, Siri doesn't understand my language, Google Home doesn't understand my language, all these things we use to understand my language. In the next 20 years, my kids may not even understand the Yoruba language or my Igbo language or my language. Something needs to be done about it. What we're trying to say in this event is you can do something about it. You don't have to wait for Google. You don't have to wait for Meta. You don't have to wait for someone to do it for you. You also don't need to wait for Elon Musk. But you yourself can build the change that you want. And one straightforward way to build the chain since it's a data-driven technology it means it requires data so you one way you can do create the change you want is to build the data you can build the data by offering services so we have the translators and transcriptions and there are voiceovers and everything you can also build the data by building a data project okay going forward this is just the beginning. We have, at Landfrica, we have a mandate to support. So by the end of next year, 2025, we want to be able to see at least 10 data collection projects that have been finished. When you registered, some of you mentioned um, languages that you would like to work on, you that you, that are dying or that are that you've not seen any technology for. In the chat, some of you also mentioned dialects that that you've not seen much work for. So it is clear that many of you have you recognize the need for language inclusion. You recognize the scarcity of the uh, or the non exclusion non inclusion of your language in a data-driven technology. What we're trying to support is people who will go the extra step as in starting, as Mr. Samuel said, just start, in starting to actually do something about this by taking on data building or data collection. And we, hope that by the end of next year, we will be able to support. By support, I mean offer different kinds of support for at least 10 of them to push them from ideation to completion. The kinds of support we'll be offering, one is a, a community. You think of this more as a community of communities because, like I said, there are really actually 
and good number of communities out there doing wonderful things. I think I saw Isaac Manzi from here too. Wonderful community, Digital Muganda for the Kenyan Wanda language. And as you learn from Mr. Samuel's presentation, it doesn't matter. Like, it's not, oh, they speak Kenyan Wanda, I speak Igbo, so we have nothing in common. No, as Mr. Samuel said in his presentation on on unknown language, just because you don't know that language doesn't mean you cannot collaborate on projects there. So it's important to not see language as a dividing factor, but see the work we are doing in trying to build for our languages as a uniting factor. So it doesn't matter whether you, it's not really a problem where you don't speak a language, you, there are still avenues for collaboration. So support that we are, we'll be, we'll, we are working towards offering is providing a community which would most likely be linking with other communities. The community is to provide support for data builders. And then we're also thinking of doing some kind of how to do it video. So we're thinking like very short videos that give you a very, as short as five minutes, like here's how to do this, like do this, do this, do this. And then the wonderful thing of community is networking. So if you actually say you want to start a project, the community would offer a place for you to ask questions, to get help and to collaborate. So in a nutshell, expect some of the things to expect from us. We're still thinking of what this community would look like because you know we are thinking of the best way to sort of bring people together. Uh, we may create a WhatsApp group or something. I, I, I don't know. But the community is mostly to support data builders. So people who want to who want to be data builders. The data builders are people who want to engage in a data collection. So they want to um, supervise or initiate a data for your language, or you want to provide provide the services. And then we would also have other videos in the coming and coming soon, which which are more target specific. So this meeting, this event was very generic. We touched on different things, but the upcoming videos will be more specific. So let's say you have a particular data that you want to collect. How can you how can you think about the problem, the solution? How can you write a proposal? What are the things to include in your proposal? How can you find funding opportunities? So if you're going for language preservation, what are the funding opportunities there? If you're going for um, more commercial oriented, what are the, the opportunities there? Uh, what are some of the lessons learned from other data create builders? So we're also thinking of having some kind of potentially having some interviews with data creators to learn some of the lessons. Okay. So please remember, build the data for the change you want in your world. And everybody has the ability to be a builder of our data-driven technologies. Thank you very much and have a wonderful rest of your day.